to the Harmony of Interest series, where we will explore ideas that positively shape our world. My name is Evan Papp, and I'm the executive producer for Empathy Media Lab that publishes content on labor, political economy, art, and culture. And we are a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. I'm very excited to talk to Elise Bryant, labor educator, artist, singer, director, and executive director of the Labor Heritage Foundation. Elise, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So I first came across to you uh, during the Labor Radio Network podcast uh, live election series and uh, the live stream and was really interested in your story. And I've seen you a couple more times on the nine to five uh, panel that you helped lead. And I also know that you're also a Michigan native. And I heard some stories about you growing up in Michigan and Detroit and going to University of Michigan, also my alma mater. Uh -huh. so I was like, I have to talk to you and I, I have to get the story and, and I really want to capture this, this uh, person's profile and history and, and bring it to as many people as possible. So I guess to begin with, uh, can you talk a little bit about your background growing up in Detroit and how you got oriented around labor? So I grew up in Southwest Detroit, which is the farthest south corner of Detroit. And we were surrounded by the Fort Rouge plant, Marathon refineries, Marathon oil refineries, and Great Lakes steel. So the air was impossible to breathe. It was so full of pollution. I suffered from asthma my entire time growing up. Uh, everybody thought it was because of hay fever, but it was really because of the pollution we found out later. My father worked at the Fort Rouge plant. He was among the uh, African-Americans who came up from the South um, when uh, Ford put out the call and he went to work in that plant and worked there until he passed in 1977. So union was just part of our life. I mean, the UAW, United Auto Workers, we, you know, everybody knew Walter Ruther. He was a local hero. Um, and the teachers union was very strong. And of course, the steel workers were really strong. The Teamsters were in Detroit. You know, so union was just part of our, our lives that we knew about and picket line. So that's one of the earliest things I learned was you never cross a picket line. I did a little piece on the Ford Hunger March or Ford yes. Hunger Massacre uh, that is literally going as they're m marching from Detroit into Dearborn towards uh, the River Rouge plant yeah. that, you know, five people get shot and killed that day, many more people injured. And I, I know what you mean. When I first was driving there, I could smell the industry in the air, as I'd like to say. And uh, it, it still, though, is this incredible place where there's just so much potential to, to build and create and to manufacture. And it, it, it is an incredible place even after all the deindustrialization that has happened. Yes, it is. And I know exactly that spot. <laughs> and I could, I could sing the song that goes with it, but we won't do that today. <laughs> another time, another time. Absolutely. So, so then you ended up going to University of Michigan and you were studying art in school and, and production and theater, is that correct? No, I was in, I was in pre-med. I, along with my best friend from high school, Ava Brown, and we, we you know, we sat together uh, all through high school because she was Brown, I was Bryant, and the person that sat behind me was Ben Carson. And Ben Carson and Ava Brown and I all started at the University of Michigan together at the same time in pre-med. <laughs> Interesting. You, you ever, t uh, ever speak to Ben Carson? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Not not recently. Not not since he got appointed. Uh, but he did used to come to our class reunions, and I and I had a couple of opportunities to um, be on the same program with him, and we would talk and share. He had a big crush on Ava Brown. Um, but interestingly enough, he was not uh, our valedictorian or salutatorian or the head of the class. But he was voted most likely to succeed, which I found fascinating. It was one of those blink moments. Yeah. But anyway, that, that's us, you know, and I always did, I was always doing theater as a kid, though. I mean, from the time I was seven years old, we used to hang the blanket on the clothesline in the backyard and would produce shows. And I wrote a play called Murder in the Dark that we performed at my family's <laughs> gathering in Georgia when we went there for a family reunion. And, uh, and I did that all through high school. I just didn't see it as a career. So how did you pivot then? I, I see on your CV that it's you are artistic director of the University of Michigan's Labor Theater Project, 
yeah. workers' lives, workers' stories in 1982. So what, what was that pivot? How did you kind of move from the pre-med to uh, this, this artistic labor um, kind of focus? Well, um, when, I went, when I started at the University of Michigan, which was 1969, it was a campus of unrest. I mean, things were going on. The anti-war movement was going on. In 1970, we staged the Black Action Movement BAM strike, where the black students went on strike at the University of Michigan demanding 10% black enrollment. And so, and it was a civil rights movement. And, you know, so I was really aware of, of social uh, justice action and was a part of that. And, but I was still doing theater on the side. I just didn't, you know, enroll in the theater department. Um, but I was asked by, uh, in 1974, by a guy named John Mifsu to join a company called, it was then called Theater Company of Ann Arbor. And it was founded by a professor at Eastern Michigan University, a woman who didn't get to direct plays in her department. So she started her own theater company. And he invited me and I was like, oh, John, gosh, golly, I mean, why would you invite me? And I said, you know, I don't have no theater background. He said, oh, I think you can act. <laughs> And I was like, really? Uh, okay. So we didn't even have an audition. I just showed up. Um, and I started, and I joined that theater company. And that was the beginning of my acting uh, on, on stage in a semi-professional. We weren't, we weren't paid. It was amateur theater company. But I did that. And Joyce and High Cornblue, High Cornblue was the director of the Labor Study Center at the University of Michigan. And his wife, Joyce Cornblue, was the head of the women's um, Labor Union Women's Department of that of that center, and they were big theater fans, and so they saw all of our shows. and And in 1982, High Corn Blue called me up and said, "Can I talk to you about something?" I was like, "Yeah, sure." And he came over and he said, "We want to start a labor theater project at the University of Michigan Labor Study Center. And we'd like you to be the director." And I was like, "Okay, you're gonna pay me?" He's like, "Yes, we're gonna pay you." I was like, "Oh, okay." okay. Yeah, we're gonna pay you to be the secretary and you'll run this theater project on the side. Cool, I was all in. I had dropped out of school, I should also mention. I dropped out of college uh, when my mother died and um, basically was hanging around town being a campus radical and activist, uh, but was not continuing my college education. So anyway, I was hired to do this labor theater project, which we named Workers' Lives, Worker Stories. And what was it about? Well, Joyce and I had this idea that labor theater, there was labor theater happening, but it's always done by professionals. And they said, what if we had workers tell their own stories, which is where the name came from. So we sent out an invitation to local unions in our area, and about uh, seven or eight people showed up at UAW Local 849 in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And we said, we're going we're gonna to tell our stories. That's what we're going to do. And I had been in theater company of Ann Arbor long enough to have the idea of how to use uh, storytelling, personal stories, to create a theater piece. So a lot of them felt, didn't feel comfortable writing their own stories, or they did, and it was like really stilted. So I said, look, talk to me, tell me your story, I'll record it, and I'll transcribe it. And I would transcribe it literally, and then I would change it, only to put, like, if something was really strong, I put it at the beginning, you know, because if something was really big, you put it at the end, you know, open strong, close big. And that was my, the, my uh, template. And so that's what we did. And we, we because there were other singers who were involved, uh, we always had like story, poem, song, story, poem, song. And that was our format. But it was really telling our own stories. And still we started getting stories and poems from other workers. And that was it. That was the basic format. Story, poem, song. I love it. I love <laughs> yeah. it. You gotta bring that back to DC. I'm uh -huh, uh -huh. It's really easy to travel with. You know, you could go we literally traveled around the country um with our shows because it was, you know, you didn't need costumes or props, you just told your story. So you also directed a labor jazz opera, Forgotten uh the Murder at Ford Rouge Plant. What what is exactly. that one about? Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Steve Jones. Okay. So I was in Ann Arbor and I was working at the University of Michigan. And I came, I moved here when I was invited to come work at the uh, George Meany Center, which became the National Labor College. So I had been coming to the Great Labor Arts Exchange since about 1984, 85. And so I knew about this event that happened in the DC area. And I met people like Steve Jones, Saul Schneiderman invited me to come, Lucy Murphy. And I knew a bunch of singers when I moved here, not a lot of actors. And I knew that New York had a labor course 
in San Francisco the labor course. And I said, why should we have a DC labor course? So I started that. And that's how Steve and I got, began working together. And Steve, who was not a playwright, um, came to my playwriting class, theater class, and decided that he would write this play about one of his ancestors, a relative of his, who was murdered in the Fort Rouge plant, Lewis Bradford. And his brother had written a song about it. Peter Jones had written a song about it. And Steve said, well, I can do this, this play. But Steve wasn't a playwright. He, he's a composer and musician. So there was not any dialogue, really, or very little dialogue. And the first time we produced it uh, at the, I directed Steve Wrote the Music uh, at, the, at the National Labor College, this woman came up to me and she said, that's the best labor jazz opera I've ever seen. And I was like, yes, labor jazz opera. You know, we had, you know, Tommy, which was the rock opera, and now we have labor jazz opera because it was more like an opera than a musical. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how it started. So that story of his relative, Louis Bradford, being found dead in the Fort Rouge plant, Steve went back and investigated with the city of Detroit morgue and they changed the record to reflect that it was a suspicious death. It was always called an accident, but Steve's questioning made them re, made the, uh, the head of the morgue change the, the standing for it. Now all the songs, the, uh, the Fort Hunger March is in that play, is in that, that opera that Steve wrote. And you also directed the labor jazz opera, Love Songs from the Liberation Wars, the yeah. 1940s tobacco worker struggle. Yes. What's that one about? How'd that one come about? Salem, Winston-Salem, you know, um, uh, Ross Pellis, who is now working with the Poor People's Campaign, used to be the civil rights director of AFL-CIO, and Phyllis Payne, who's a labor lawyer with the laborers, both grew up in Winston-Salem. And, and they told the story about how these women, the this, this strike was largely held by African-American women. And it was, it was, I mean, it was a company town, right? Literally, the tobacco company owned everything. And so they, um, these women staged the strike, and it was the it, it, it was segregated plant. White people came in one door, black people came in another. It was the first time that black and white workers came together. And the song "We Shall Overcome" was first used in a uh, labor dispute at that strike. It's Pres presumably the song features prominently then in yeah. the yeah. yeah yeah yeah. I never knew that, and I'm sure most people you know, we'll be learning that the first time they're hearing oh, it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no. oh yeah. And we went, we went down to, we went down to Winston-Salem and met with people there and Ross took us on a tour and it was amazing. So that's our hope is to do it there next. Same thing we did Forgotten in Detroit. Oh my God, it was a huge hit, <laughs> as you can imagine. So before we start talking a little bit about the National Labor College and your work there as an educator and professor, and we close out the, the Michigan chapter. Uh, could you talk a bit about just how labor changed uh, through the 70s and going into the 80s in, in that area? And I, this may be a question that goes right into your work as a labor educator as well. My parents' front door was unlocked every night un until the 70s and 80s. All through our childhood, you could literally walk in our parents' house. It was that safe in our neighborhood. And it was because, and everybody was working, everybody was employed, it, it, either in the steel mill or at the, at the board or someplace or the government. And so we, we grew, I grew up thinking we were middle class. It wasn't until I went to the University of Michigan when I met the real middle class that I realized that we were the working poor, just one paycheck away from poverty. But there were, I mean, there were people, you know, of color and, and mixed in our neighborhoods at that time. And the labor movement was, was strong, as you know, it came back after the war and, you know, people were just, you know, full, not full employment, but largely employed at good paying jobs, at jobs that where you could afford to send your kids to college, which is what my parents did. They paid for my brothers and sisters uh, to go to college. I, was, I had a scholarship, but the rest of them, my parents paid for it. My father could do that on his paycheck from the Fort Rouge plant. Then, as of course, you know, the 80s happened and as they started outsourcing and taking out those industrial jobs, then things changed. And really, I think that um, that that move of uh, industry out of and into it, it, you know, overseas as much as possible or in Mexico or in the, in the Caribbean, um, where they also move jobs to, is something that, you know, we know about in the labor movement, but I don't think the general public knows. Yeah. It's how devastating that was to the to the economy 
uh, in those industrial places, which became known as the Rust Belt, right? And I was born in Cleveland. My dad was in anodized aluminum manufacturing and uh, lived in Michigan. And when you go through Detroit, you can see pictures of how robust Detroit was with a population over a million uh, in the 1920s, 1930s. And now it's it's probably around less than 600,000 and it's pretty sprawled. Yeah. And people don't understand Detroit was the largest center of production the world had ever seen up until that point. Yes. And we allowed Wall Street to do to us what the Nazis could have only hoped to do to break our Lend-Lease program to, to Europe and to Russia yes. and Soviet Union to fight the Nazis. And if people didn't want to buy cars, we could have just retooled it into grain harvesters and combines and exported those around the world. So because everyone needs farm equipment, everyone needs different types of machine tool sectors to be able to develop uh, their own economies, and and yet we allowed the financiers to to completely dismantle it, and it's it's tragic. Um, it's tragic, and it, it's cost how many lives and miseration and poverty. So it, definitely something I want to to raise awareness. Right. Most people don't have that awareness of, of how prosperous Detroit was, and a lot of these cities were. Mm -hmm. And also, Detroit had become you know a largely African American city as uh, white people fled to the suburbs. And it was powerful in that respect in terms of the NAACP and voting and how decimated it became after the riots in 67. And after they, after, you know, black business after black business failed. Um, and so Detroit has, you know, huge food deserts and banking deserts where there's not a grocery store around. There's not a furniture store around. There's not, you know, there's gas stations. There's a bunch of stuff missing. And I think that that was definitely a political decision, as is race and racism anyway. I mean, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a social construct. It's not a biological construct. It's a political construct to keep the working class separated. And they do a really good job. <laughs> they think Donald Trump is their hero. That's what a good job they did to convince the white working class this man has anything in common with them whatsoever. Yeah, don't even get me started. Donald okay. Trump coming from Wall Street, never screwing up his ass his entire life. Has been, I mean, he fires contractors constantly. He stiffs everyone around. Yeah. And yeah. yet these people think he has their interests in mind. It's 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 complete like false consciousness totally. uh, uh, throughout the land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. this. But I mean, it's the history of of the growth of demagogues and the rise of fascism at yeah. this kind of late stage finance capital, capitalism that we're seeing, um, where the system is so parasitized and financialized that um, everyone's losing their place in society. So they grip to, the people who were once in the middle are gripping to this this one person who can, at least yeah. they can feel powerful through, even if they're not. Yeah. Even if they're not, but they can project that, Yeah. right? Meanwhile, you know, the cost of living has accelerated where pay has not, you know, Take home pay and, and all these people, all those people working at Amazon for $15 an hour. I mean, how could you, you couldn't, how can you, you can't raise a family on $15 an hour, even if both people are working at $15 an hour. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And it's just, it's gone on for way too long. I think the labor movement also has some responsibility here because I think that one of the things we could have been doing is building international solidarity. So wherever the capitalists go, that's where the union goes. Right, so we're working with the people in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Guatemala who are, you know, making clothing and making sure those countries are organized and they have union. So there's no place for them to run to. And with everyone talking about China right now, why aren't we also talking about Wall Street and all the companies that are on Wall Street that are making products in China? Like we should <laughs> highlight that, show the entire supply chains. Absolutely. So it, it's not it's not just the Chinese government. It's oh, Wall no. Street with the Chinese government. Absolutely. Because you know, they don't care. They don't no. care if you're a mad dictator murdering all your people. If they can make a product there and sell it here for five times the amount they pay for it. It's called progress. And I don't think uh, labor unions are um, at least independent ones are, are very welcome in, in a lot of these places where Wall Street uh, and, and globalization is just a way of union busting, even though they taught it in so many of the public policy schools that I went to an undergraduate at that time was this great 
idea of globalization, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it's just a backdoor union busting race to the bottom runaway shop policy. Uh -huh. yeah. It's what Christopher Columbus was out there looking for, right? <laughs> we can get this over here, you know, globalization. Yeah, no, been around for a long time. So your your work as a educator uh, at the professor and a professor at the National Labor College, what what was that work like? Uh, you were there for quite a few years. Um, what was the National Labor College and, and uh, what type of classes were you teaching and what were the students like? The National Labor College was the West Point of the labor movement. Well, it, at least it should have been. It, it, it was there in, in theory. Um, I, having worked at the Labor Studies Center at the University of Michigan, I was aware that there were other labor education centers around the country. But this was this was Labor's own, funded by the AFL-CIO, um, and it was a place where people were originally you were sent by your your local, you know they would say you you, Evan at least you go to this, you take these classes, and so um, there was classes on collective bargaining and organizing and health and safety and uh, labor history. Um, I through my work at the University of Michigan, I became quite familiar with teaching. Quite a few classes. You had to be a jack of all trades there, and I also learned about learner-centered education, um, popular education, as a lot of people call it, but a way of teaching that wasn't standing in front of the room and lecturing, but engaging the the learner in the own process so that they are doing activities, not just sitting back and listening. People only can retain you know twenty percent of what they see and hear. They retain ninety percent what they see, hear, discuss, and do. And most adults learn learners learn best by doing. So I had learned that at the Uni University of Michigan Labor Study Center, and I brought that with me to the National Labor College. Um, I was uh, teaching leadership skills. I was teaching labor relations in the federal sector, uh, and of course, I taught effective speaking. So that was my that was my number one subject. And the way I learned to teach that was I went to an effective speaking class at women's school, and the two instructors stood there for two days and lectured. No, they didn't lecture. They talked about their story. They talked, here's that about one time I was speaking at the war stories. And this happened a lot. And I was like, no, no, no. It seems to me that if you're teaching a class on effective speaking, somebody should give a speech before the class is over. And it should not be the instructors. So I studied uh, with Karen Rowe and learned about adult teaching techniques and took that with me into leadership training, uh, as well as labor lessons in the federal sector and the use of participants as uh, planning committees to, to make an event more relevant to what they, they needed. So, and, and that brought me into teaching labor theater. <laughs> There's a few students said, hey, you know, what about labor theater? And I said, okay, and I offered a class and people actually showed up and every year it became more popular. Each year we had a group of students who would come, who had already been in the class, would come to go out that night to the theater. Because what they would do is they would learn the insides of theater and the history of theater. And then we go see a play and they could apply that knowledge. And when we come back the next day for class, inevitably we'd be having this discussion and, and it would stop and somebody would go, wait a minute, wait a minute, why are we talking like this? You know, talking like what? They go, we're talking like this, talk like, you know, like analysis and stuff. And I go, well, you know, you, you, you went to see a play and now you're discussing it. You know, like, you made us do this. Like, I didn't make you do anything. I just gave you the tools. You're the one, you're the one coming up with analysis. You're the one who took that knowledge and applied it to what you saw. And inevitably, they would come back the next year and they'd say, well, me and the missus are going to see a show. They would all say they only took the class because they needed humanities credit. But after that, they actually became theater goers and theater activists. It was my favorite class, of course. <laughs> and I, I think that's one of the keys to the entire idea behind labor organizing is that you're not going in there as a labor organizer to organize a union. You're there to be a catalyst, but it's about trying to create the capacity Yes. The empowerment, the dignity, the leadership within the, the yes. group. So it becomes its own democratic functioning labor uh, union. And it, it then can actually work closely with management, you know, with the same goals of trying to be a successful business, but uh, being very effective in, in, in power relations as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm sorry I did not document this at the time, but often people would go back and apply this to the picket line work or to an internal organizing effort that they were having. They would use their creativity. Once the brain is stimulated, I mean, then people start coming with their own ideas. And that's what we need more than anything else right now, is some creativity. 
So the National Labor College closed in 2014, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened and uh, how can we, are there any efforts to kind of restart something like this? I don't think there is. Um, and I, you know, the, the land that, that the college was on is, is worth bazillions of dollars. Um, but as the labor movement started losing membership, declining membership, dues per capita, uh, they started to cut their losses and they realized they could get a whole bunch of money for that land, which uh, amalgamate uh, tech, uh, not textile workers, wait, wait, uh, ATU. Amalgam Transit Union, Amalgam made it Transit Union, ATU, bought the land. And I was so glad that it stayed in union hands, at least, because it's a bazillion dollar land. But they, the, the labor movement just could not support it. Um, and uh, they just wanted, you know, when they cut, unions will often cut education first. And to me, education and organizing are absolutely essential. They should be one and the same. Because as you said, organizing isn't about me coming out and telling you what to do. It's me helping you to find your energy and power to make it to move. I'm a facilitator. I'm not the I'm not the I'm not the energy. The people are the energy. The workers are the energy. And the history too, and of the education, the history of the union, the history of the movement also yeah. I think provides context and strength and lessons learned. Oh yeah. And resilience even when you're getting your ass kicked. <laughs> and it changed lives. I mean it changed people's lives. I I, I I hear stories all the time, I and mean, where I go somewhere, there's somebody come. Oh, I remember you from the National Labor College, and they, you know, people took on those leadership roles in their unions. People took on innovative ideas into their unions, and I think that that's worth documenting as well. So I want to talk about your role as president of the Coalition of Labor Union Women. How did that come about, and what is it? <laughs> the Coalition of Labor Union Women. Uh, was founded on March 24th, 1974. We're going to celebrate our anniversary this coming March in Women's History Month. And it was a group of women who came together and said, you know, we are we're dealing with the sexism in the labor movement where women are not allowed to be in leadership positions, who are not encouraged and supported in leadership positions. Uh, a dear friend of mine, one of the members of Workers' Lives, Workers' Stories, um, and I recently reconnected during the pandemic and talked during years. And we were talking about Hillary Clinton, and she reminded me about the time when she ran for office at her local. And they circulated a picture of a naked woman, imposed her picture on it with a bunch of men standing around, and said, this is her. She's a whore. Don't vote for her. And I had totally forgotten about it, and it just all came back to me. Because the reason I ran for president of the Coalition of Labor Union Women is because I had held union office and was on the board of my executive board of my local for years, but I had never run for a contested position. I'd never run for a top officer position. I encourage women all the time, you must run for office, you have to be active. That's what, you know, Clue was founded on a woman's place is in her union. Well, a woman's place is in, not just in her union, but in the leadership of her union. And so when I watched the debacle of uh, the Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump uh, run and, and the election of this man, and the kind of hate and vitriol that came out against Hillary Clinton, who was not my candidate, she wasn't my first choice, but once the Democrats decided that's who they wanted, I was like, okay, let's get behind this. But it was ridiculous. And so the next morning when I got up in a depression and my friend Dan knocked on the door and said, would you like coffee or opiates? I said, I'll take the coffee, please. And I dragged myself out and watched her give her concession speech and I started crying. I wasn't crying for Hillary. Hillary's tough. She has her own uh, thing to take care of her. I wasn't worried about her, but I was worried about the people who voted for a man who absolutely had no credentials whatsoever to be the president of the United States. And they would vote for him over her and her credentials. And I said, okay, you talk, you talk, the talk at least. Why don't you run for office? Run for a contested position. Let's start with our local. So, CWA and Newsweek Guild Local 32035, I decided to run for vice president, not president, because I knew I wasn't going to have that much time to give. But I thought I wanted to be engaged. And I ran and we lost. So the Clue Convention was coming up, and I talked to Connie Leakes, and she wasn't going to run. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to run. Regardless of who runs, I'm going to run because I want to 
really make a significant impact into the into the work I've been committed my life to doing, both racism and sexism, because I can't ignore the fact that I'm black, but working with women and helping women to rise up in their union. I thought this would be the place to, to do this nationally on a national basis. So I ran and won. And then we re-ran our local elections and I won that too. So I became president of CLU in September and then vice president of my local in December. And up until this year, to this this month, I was serving in both capacities. Wow. But I wanted to I wanted to do what I've been telling other people to do. And I also wanted to do it in a way that would help really move women forward significantly uh, in the labor movement. And the head of like the head departments of the AFL CIO are generally male, white males. I, I believe that it's it's changing a little bit, but there's still a lot of a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, a lot of work to be done. And how can how can white males be more supportive of more diversity? I mean, is it just stepping aside, just letting other people run, getting out of the way? Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it's that. It's mentorship, right? Uh, and it's recognizing that we need to be as diverse as the workforce that we represent. I mean, women should be in office in their unions equivalent to their percentage in that workforce. So because it will bring a balance to it and ideas to it and 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 direction that is lacking right now. I mean, the, the fact that you know that they for the last couple of lectures have been worrying about losing white men. Who cares about losing white men when all these people and women, all these people of color, are out there in charge to vote? And we know what happened in Georgia, and they because of the pandemic, they did it without the AFL-CIO and the unions. I think I think um, Unite Here was the only one was the exception that sent sent folks to Georgia. But they did that, and that was largely led by women of African-American descent. And that's what happens when you give the community the power and the money to do it, and you don't have to fly in and parachute us in from outside to, to help people with an election. I think that it's recognizing where the priorities are. It's not that you ignore white men, but you need to do some education. There needs to be some education on toxic masculinity. And there's what 60 70 million people who don't vote every year right. and there's a question why what are they doing what are they thinking where are they at why aren't yeah. we getting them involved in the process yeah. i mean if the margin's seven million and you have you know tens of millions of people not voting why aren't we figuring out how to get those people to vote and get those votes and blow out the margins um and those votes are oftentimes outside of you know the traditional white suburban whatever that you know has been become the margin since like the new democrats took over with clinton and um and you see it changing now in 2020 so in 2018. right and sharing you know th this was a, an exercise that someone taught me one time is have people like turn around and and change something about themselves so they turn around take off their glasses and they turn around and they switch their hair to the other side you know they turn around take the sweater off right no one ever thinks to turn around and put something back on, right? They put the, take the glass off, put it back on, because people associate change with loss. And so the ruling class, the 100%, are, are deathly afraid of their loss of wealth, and they will do anything to maintain it. And you can recognize that change is inevitable. The only thing that doesn't change is that which is extinct. And so we have to change. It's part of the process. I mean, the industrial unions brought more people of color in than the trade unions did. The AFL-CIO was, you know, pretty exclusively men of European descent. And the CIO, Congress of Industrial Organization, was, was organized in the UAW. And the steel mills were the production lines where people considered it just monkey work because you didn't need the skill to do that. It was on an assembly line. And that changed the labor movement. And the same thing, that has to change or we're going to die. I was having this exact same conversation because I have the exact same philosophical view of the universe where the universe is constant change. And if you try to be static in it, you're going to go extinct. You have to be able to evolve and progress and grow with consciousness as the universe right. changes. However, oligarchy and ruling class, when they're on top, they don't, they, they don't want any changes. They want to maintain it. And they will, if, if they succeed, 
they will take down the entire system and everyone with them. Yep. So even even for their own self preservation, they need to let go of the their control of the system and 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 trying to preserve the status quo, which yes uh, can't maintain itself when when you have the universal change of of the universe. So. Right. You know, and I don't. I used to not believe in term limitations. You know, I thought that people should serve as long as they willing or can serve. But I no longer believe that. I think you need it. It's hard to get something done in two years. We need to change in our local for sure. Four years, okay, I feel like I'm just getting something done. I will run again for president of the Coalition Labor Union because I feel like we just got started, got kind of pushed back by the pandemic. But in four years, if I haven't done what I think helped move the organization in the way that we were supposed, we need to move and grow, then not, not just grow in terms of numbers, but grow in terms of getting women elected to office, both in the unions and, and publicly in government. Then, then, but it's time to pass the baton. I don't want to be here for the rest of my life. I don't want to do this. And I also believe this, if you're doing it right as a leader, you should have at least five people behind you. Not one, not your favorite, but you know, at least five people behind you can say, I know this person's been trained. I know this person's been working. I see what they do. I can say this person, this person, this person would be good for this position. You have to be able to pass the baton and let go. <laughs> and that's what creates the sustainability of the, the generational Absolutely. growth. Absolutely where each person can kind of fill the next spot at a higher level of potential. Mm -hmm. You're also uh, part of the Labor Heritage Foundation. You're a very busy person. What, what is that and uh, how can people learn more about it? The Labor Heritage Foundation is a cultural arts organization. And I got this from Chris Garlock. We're the art and soul of the labor movement. And largely it was started by uh, uh, three white guys with guitars uh, Joe Uline, Joe Glazer, and Saul Schneiderman. Uh, but it was a coming together of, of singer and activists uh, in the labor movement to share and swap songs. Uh, eventually branched into the Great Labor Arts Exchange when, hot, when Saul got the idea of inviting me as a theater person to come to the Great Labor Arts Exchange and said, oh, theater is part of this. Oh, visual arts, are part, photography is part of this. Sculpturing is part of this. Um, spoken word, poetry. I mean, all this, and so the, it started growing in terms of artistic disciplines that were drawn to the event. Um, in 2013, our uh, executive director left and uh, we were financially in a hole. So I said, oh, I'll step in and be interim executive director uh, until we can get our feet back on the ground. And then, because <laughs> I, had, I had left the National Labor College in 2011. I was offered a buyout. I saw where the college was going. I didn't like it, and so I took a buyout. And I started my own consulting company. But anyway, on the side, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do this job at the Labor Heritage Foundation. Me and Fran Owens got into it and we're like, hey, we could do this. Let's do this. And we could do it for less because both of us had pensions, so we didn't have to work for time. Uh, and I said, okay, let's let's get this arts exchange off the ground this year. And once we get it going, we'll see what happens. And voila, <laughs> still here. But this year we're doing something a little different. What, what's going on this year? This year I said, look, we, uh, we know the spoken word and poetry is the folk music of the next generation, right? There's much more, many more people doing spoken word uh, than there are creating new labor songs of that generation. So I said, why don't we like take the Saturday of the Labor Arts Exchange, which is usually our busiest and most more people attend, and, and turn it over to the next generation who've been coming to the Arts Exchange and say, hey, y'all organize it. You, you choose the workshops, you choose the instructors and the speakers. Uh, and then we'll do the concert at the end. So I invited uh, 14 of our next generation uh, members uh, and a couple who weren't, hadn't been to the Arts Exchange, but I've, I know them for spoken word artists and they're really good. So I invited them all to come. We met last Saturday, they said, yes, let's do it. So this year, we're gonna be online again. We're not gonna be in person, uh, but Saturday will be Next Generation Day at the Great Labor Arts Exchange because I really want to pass this on. I really believe the importance of culture to, to, to take care of our spirit and our soul. It, it, doing stuff with the brain is not sufficient. It's not what makes people thrive. I mean, you can't, you, you know, the, the plants aren't gonna grow unless you fertilize the ground, unless you provide something, nourishment, besides the sunlight. Because if you just only have sunlight, they're gonna die anyway. Don't get enough nourishment, they're gonna die anyway. It's a labor movement. We need the nourishment of culture. 
and beauty and beauty. poetry and literature and film and pop, yes. music and dance and uh -huh. bring it all yep. together because that that's the roses right on that is friends, so. that is that is that is the roses Everything so looking into the the future of organizing where do you see we should be putting our resources and our strategies you know in the in the coming weeks months years i mean we we can go wherever you want with this uh, you know short term long term well you know you make me think evan that i should call the amazon people who are organizing in this area because i i, I said this before but i really believe it's true if i were queen of the labor movement i would have class i i would have every organizing every organizer in a teaching techniques class and in a creative using arts to create change because i really think the combination of both is is really what we need to in, to engage people in their hearts and their souls as well as their minds and that i mean because you know this idea of just going to sort of bust in there and so i mean things have changed and culturally things have changed i mean the fact that more people get their information from from online than they're going to ever read a newspaper again is something to be taken into consideration and so that's what I would do. I would provide that training across the country, in the communities, in the communities where people live. And as you talk about storytelling, uh, oftentimes it's emotion that gets people oh. to really move and, and, and kind of grow and change with the characters that they see in the story. And, and I think music and, and poetry and art, and that, that is a way to to bring about that emotion in a way when not as many people are reading as much in these days. I, if I were queen of the UAW, which is my, my family, my UAW baby, I would take the labor jazz opera forgotten around the country. I would produce it in every community where you want to organize and use the people in that community to be in the show and open it to the public because it, it provides education, it provides inspiration, it uses all the art forms, visual and oral, and it tells a story that people aren't gonna get anyplace else. They're not gonna get it on Netflix, they're not gonna get it on Hulu, they're not gonna get it on HBO. We have to tell our stories. When people hear those stories, they go, that's me, that's my story. And I think we'd be more inclined, I think it would be a great orientation. I dream.